lecture on textualism in interpretations in law and literature class. And I'd like to begin with a definition of textualism. And textualism is the blending of formalism and historicism to any literary text in order to create an interpretation that is self-validating. And it's some of the beliefs of textualists is that there's one accurate meaning in a text. And by looking at the formal elements of a text, which is formalism, all the poetic devices, setting, imagery, connotations, tone shifts, work to develop meaning, that can get you one accurate interpretation. Or for historicists, looking at the intentions of the author, um, the historical context in which the author was, was working, um, and how those, man in the biographical events of the author's life, and how those manifest in texts. So they're really working with facts. They're working um, with objective reality here, the actual elements of the text that produce meaning, and the biographical events, the historical context, or facts that manifest in texts. And the goal here for textualists, um, the name for it in law is strict is, is, uh, is textualism as well. The goal here is objectivity, decreasing the reader's subjective personal view of what the text means. And when we get to the law, we'll see why objectivity is so important to a valid Supreme Court opinion of the Constitution. But for starters, we're going to start with formalism. Remember, textualism is a blend of formalism and historicism. And formalism is something that most students are familiar with at the community school. It's looking at the language of a text and grounding your interpretation in how language works. And one of the assumptions or tenets of formalism is that poems, short stories, novels are icons. They are verbal icons. They cannot be translated. They cannot achieve what they are achieving in meaning in any other words. Okay? So there's that sort of respect for the text itself. And that's evident here. Text should be treated as independent, autonomous, self-sufficient verbal objects. They are verbal icons. But the even more important tenet is this one. You'll hear me use a phrase, contextual pressure, a lot. And when I use the word contextual pressure, I'm referring to where an interpreter, where a literary critic goes to determine the meaning of a text. And for a formalist, the contextual pressure of an interpretation lies within the verbal constructs, within the poetic devices, um, within how language is used in order to create meaning. And so for formalists, Meaning lies in coherence and unity. All texts must cohere in the patterns of languages, the structure of literary devices, and the context of form. So coherence and unity are words you'll hear a lot with formalists. If you have an image in the beginning of the poem and an, another image later on in the poem, they should work together to create meaning. If you have verbal irony um, in the first five lines, um, and then dramatic irony in the last five lines, those two ironies should work together to develop meaning. If they contradict or they don't cohere, and it's unclear how they work together, then formalists would argue you have a bad poem. And good formalist criticism uh, will demonstrate mastery of devices. So uh, in sophomore, freshman and sophomore year at the community school, you learn what FIX means. And FIX is just an acronym to remind you of how to look at poetic devices in particular. So it's figurative language, metaphor, simile, personification, irony, that's all figurative language, F. Imagery, looking at the different images in a poem, connotations, the emotional associations of words. Tone shifts is the T, looking at how the voice carries a line differently at different times in the poem, carries meaning. And then two S's, sound devices, alliteration, consonants, assonance, and scansion, the metrical variations in a poem. All of those are the formal elements, formal, formal elements that allow a poet to create meaning in a poem as opposed to prose. So we're going to focus most of our energies on poetry, particularly frost poetry. So three key elements, verbal icon, textual pressure, pressure in patterns and coherency, and then use of poetic devices. A couple more things to think about. Um, one of the assumptions that they make 
is that text, short story, novel, poems, are unique formal constructs, and they are independent of the reader and the author. So the greatest determiner of meaning out of these familiar boxes, out of text, author, and reader, the most important element for formalists is the text. Doesn't matter what the author said, doesn't matter what literary period the author was, was writing in, doesn't matter that biographical offense may manifest themselves in texts, it doesn't matter what you bring to the poem, how you resonate with the poem, how your life experience informs and attracts you to certain lines and words and not others. For formalists, it's all about how the text is formed, how the devices cohere and create unity. Formalists assume that the speaker is not the author, so the first person I in a poem is not necessarily Robert Frost. It can be a persona or a speaker. And it can be someone, it can, if you're a male poet, you could write from the perspective of a female speaker. If you are a young poet, 16 years old, you could write a poem from the perspective of an older man. Road Not Taken, Frost's famous poem, written from the perspective of an old man, was written when Frost was 34 years old. So, separate the I from the speaker. Good poems, and formalists believe that there are good poems and bad poems, and there are. But for good poems for formalists are highly complex in their formal elements that enhance meaning. So, rich in irony, very complex images, a great pattern of word choice, connotations that develop a meaning, um, and you'll see that in Frost. Okay, so some key elements, some key assumptions that formalists make, let's put it into practice with a poem by Robert Frost called The Onset. I'll just read the poem to you and then we'll look at how we would attack it as a formalist in order to create a self-validating interpretation. The Onset, always the same when on a faded night, at last the gathered snow lets down as white as may be in dark woods, and with a song it shall not make all again, all again, all winter long, of hissing on the yet uncovered ground. I almost stumble, looking up and round, as one who, overtaken by the end, gives up his errand and lets death descend upon him where he is, with nothing done to evil, no important triumph won, more than if life had never been begun. Yet all the precedent is on my side. I know that winter death has never tried the earth, but it has failed. The snow may heap in long storms and on drifted four feet deep as measured against maple, birch, and oak. It cannot check the peeper's silver croak. And I shall see the snow all go downhill in water of a slender April rill. That flashes tail through last year's withered break and dead weeds like a disappearing snake. Nothing will be left but here a birch and there a clump of houses with a church. So the first thing you need to do when, you're, when we're working with a poem is to discover what the message is here. Um, Just for the interest of time, I'll give you the message and we'll, we'll try to find the, the formal elements that allowed me to come to the conclusion that this is the poem's central message. So in here you have a lot of natural imagery. You have this idea that winter's coming. There's nothing holding it back. There's this fear that winter is going to prevail and dominate and take away all beauty and take away all life. Um, but in the second stanza, you get this notion that precedent is on the speaker's side. That winter death has never won and dominated completely in the natural world. And even though the snow may heap four feet deep, it will go away in a slender April rill. It will disappear with its tail like a disappearing snake in that slender April rill. And all that will be left of white, not snow, in the springtime are birch trees, houses, and the church. We'll talk about those three symbols. So the central message is, you know, something along the lines of, although you know, 
nature seems to be destructive. The speaker learns The speaker concludes that spring and hope will prevail. very much concerned with the destructive force in nature, he was very much concerned um, with having hope and overcoming his own despair. Okay. Um, the speaker in this poem. Okay. So something along those lines. And I won't do all, I won't go through all the poetic, uh, poetic elements that would take too long, but I will hit on a few. Um, So something along the lines of personification, which falls under, under the rubric of figurative language, the F and fix. So right away, always the same when on a faded night. So the night is personified as faded. Okay, and to say that a night is faded, to say that someone is faded, is to say that they don't have control. They don't have free will to influence their outcome. And so this night is a faded night, the darkness it doesn't control, and on top of that, it's the first snowfall. It doesn't have control over the heaping snow that is bound to come. It's faded, it's a very dark notion here, right away with personification. Well, the onset, I skipped it. Connotations were the emotional associations of the onset. Well, the onset's the beginning of something. But when we use the word onset, we often use it in a sense of the onset of a cold or the onset of depression, the onset of a disease. And so here we have, right away, in the title, we have the sense that the emotional associations with this word are of dejection, of a foreboding future. Okay? Two good connotations of that word onset. Um, and he compares himself to an individual out here. Uh, he's looking around, he's seeing it snow for the first time, and he says in a simile, that he says he's like one who's been, who gives up his errand. He lets death descend upon himself, the alliteration of D, D, to focus you upon death descending on the night, on the season, on the speaker, more than as if his life had never been begun. So this speaker has given up, has no hope, he's bereft, to use a word for Frost used in another poem, um, and he compares, he says, I am like this individual, as if I have no other errands, have no purpose, death is descending, as if my life had never been begun. Pretty bleak here in the first stanza, with our personification, our connotation, and our simile, and a little bit of alliteration, so you see how important poetic devices are, but then we get um, a change in tone, a change in idea in the last stanza. You can see, I'll put in parentheses, the elements that jump out. Okay. So we know it's still more of a sort of a dejected tone. The winter death is coming. An undrifted four feet deep is coming um, against the maple, birch, and oak. But then it shifts in tone. And he says, sort of hopeful, and I would say in a hopeful tone, I shall see, I know, that the water of a slender April will that flashes through last year's withered break and dead wings like a disappearing snake he knows that all of that snow melt will result in nothing but a slender April rill, great visual image, and that nothing will left white but here a birch, and there a clump of houses, white houses, Vermont, New Hampshire, and then a church. And I'm going to argue that the most important poetic devices 
of all these are they are all symbols. So out of this fear of winter coming and never letting go, out of this fear, this heaping of snow, he says all that will be left white will be a birch, nature growing from the runoff, a clump of, clump of white houses, family, community, and a white church. If you've ever been to New England, you know this scene. Birch trees, white houses, white church. Classic pastoral Vermont. Sorry, we got cut off there, now I'm back. Um, we were talking about the different symbols here at the end of the poem. Remember the hopeful tone shift, the visual image of the, all the snow turning into a slender April rill, and then we have the symbols of birch, houses, church, all white. That's all that's left um, from the winter that will be white. And so we have nature growing from the runoff, family and community supporting the speaker, and then a connection to God, uh, a spiritual connection that sustains him. So working through the poem all the way from personification, connotations, to imagery, to tone, um, to the last image of the slender April rill, to the three symbols allows us to get to that final, get to the support that message that although nature seems to have its own destructive force within itself, ultimately the speaker concludes that there is hope in spring's return and even beyond that, I would add that there's hope for life in a strong connection to nature, a strong connection to family, community, and a strong connection to spirituality. Very complex unity, um, coherence of the formal elements, and I didn't mention Frost Life, um, and I didn't mention my personal connection to this poem. The most important thing to determine meaning for formless are the formal elements within the text themselves.